Over to Dr. Fogla. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. I am not sure if Dr. Himanshu Mehta and Dr. Himanshu Mehta have joined in. Yes. And Dr. Satyamurthy as well. Yeah, MS Ravindra sir also here. I just saw him logging in. Uh, hi, KP. Hi, Sonu. Hi, yeah. sir. Hi, sir. And our moderators are also there. Dr. Susan, Dr. Ratnesh and Dr. Divya. Yeah, Ratnesh is there. And mm. also, yeah, you can start with the... Fine. We are, we are already running half an hour late. So yeah. we'll start with the session. So as Sonu pointed out, this is a session that focuses on uh, management of keratoconus and looks at the options in managing complications of uh, refractive surgery and also the common complication of dry eye and the management of the same. So for the first talk in uh, keratoconus, we have Dr. Sujata Das from LVPI Bhupneshwar to talk about uh, the overview of cross-linking. Dr. Sujata, please. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes. yes you can see, please go ahead. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'll be speaking on the collagen cross lately, especially focus on keratoconus. No, it is a chronic progressive corneal disease characterized by progressive stromal thinning and corneal ectasia. and visual improvement. Starts around 14, 15 years and progresses up to mid 30s. Patient is seen in 25 to 30 percent of patients. So till 2003, we did not have any procedure to stop the progression. So collagen cross-linking is a standard, minimally invasive, safe treatment for progressive keratoconus. It is started by Ullensack. Aim of this process is to slow or possibly stop the progression to avoid the need for keratoplasty. It has significantly altered the management of keratoconus once it started. So the, this basically was on 250 to 300 micrometer of the micron of the anterior stroma. And riboflavin acts as a photosensitizer. And when it works with riboflavin and ultraviolet ray, a pre oxygen radical is produced and which links cross link formation by natural isyl oxidase. So anybody who has seen collagen cross linking uh, papers in the initial days, they will see definitely this picture, which is cross, the above one is cross linked cornea. And you can see after collagen cross linking, there are multiple bonds which is increased. If you see histopathology, there is significant increase in collagen fiber diameter after collagen cross linking. The cornea are increased resistance to pepsin digestion, it increases biomechanical stability. In addition to keratoconus, the indication are PMCD, ectasia, especially after LASIK, and it is used for microbial keratitis management and bullous keratopathy. In addition to other slit lamp examination and visual acuity, uh, these are mandatory corneal topography, and documenting progression is mandatory to know whether the cornea ectasia is increasing or not. Echometry, ultrasonic anyway, is not useful. You have to depend on the topography or antisigmatosity. Specular is optional, especially if it is a thin cornea, somebody may do specular. The standard protocol, which is named in uh, Dresden protocol, named after the city where it started, is used to do seven millimeter corneal epithelium debridement and using riboflavin for 30 minutes soaking. Then cornea is exposed to UV light again another for 30 minutes. However, the limitation of the Dresden protocol is because of epithelial removal, this significant pain. It is like PRK pain. Today morning, I was listening to PRK pain, how to manage PRK pain. It is similar to PRK pain. And theoretically, it increases the risk of infection. Of course, we see more infection compared to PRK. And it, one hour of surgery time. And most of the patients who come in a moderate to advanced stage are not suitable. So to overcome this limitation, we have many modifications. Is transepithelial collagen cross-linking for thinner cornea? I'll describe later what are the modifications, then accelerated collagen cross-linking, iron toporosis, and CXL plus and extra procedure. So coming to the transepithelial, which is known as epion. So riboflavin, because it's a high molecular weight and hydrophilic molecule, it cannot penetrate intact epithelium. So we need chemicals which increase the permeability. Uh, these are the 
chemicals like benz alkonium chloride or tetracaine containing anesthetic used long before the surgery and in comparison to president protocol or conventional one this depth of stromal demarcation line is less which is 200 micron again similarly biomechanical rigidity also increased only 64% compared to 320% which is just another way of uh, 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 deal with the thin cornea is hypoosmolar riboflavin and trans epithelial already I have uh, discussed and antiporosis is another way of thin cornea uh, lenticular assisted cross linking and contact lens assisted cross linking these are used for thin cornea so if you go one by one hypoosmolar riboflavin is most commonly used for thin cornea the osmolarity is less and the riboflavin is used without dextra Cornea can be increased to 36 to 110 micron with hypoosmolar riboflavin. And studies have proven that if you use and if you check the pachymetry before exposing to UBA, there is no endothelial cell loss, but make sure this is 400 micron before we expose to UBA. Uh, then epithelium op technique, uh, this is a contact lens. Contact lens is an inexpensive and simple procedure. It's only thing you need is BUV barriers, uh, barrier free soft contact lens. And at the same time, when patient's cornea is exposed to riboflavin for half an hour, contact lens is soaked in 0.1% riboflavin for 30 minutes. And then it is same as just in protocol. Again, the uh, stiffening effect is less compared to conventional one. This ion toporosis is a trans epithelial method. Uh, water soluble low molecular weight riboflavin is used and penetration of riboflavin is increased by using low intensity current the uh, it compared to epi on technique the penetration is more great uh, greater and deeper penetration and it shortens the time required for the treatment a lenticular technique is described by dr sasdev uh, we when we remove myopic uh, smile the lenticular can be used and denticle is placed at the apex of the core. And again, that is followed as the same conventional protocol exposure for uh, 30 minutes. And this is customized technique. It is not commonly used. It is described that you don't debride the epithelium on the apex of the core. And the rest of the paracentral, para, paracentral cornea, you remove the epithelium. As you don't remove, so the CXL effect is seen 150 micron in the area of epithelium on and 250 micron in the epithelium of uh, Then accelerated, accelerated uh, collagen cross-linking. Uh, it delivers same energy as conventional protocol, but with shorter period. So main advantage is reduced treatment time, thereby uh, theoretically again decreasing the risk of infection maybe, but most important is the reduced treatment time. Uh, so many many permutation combination has been described, uh, but most commonly used is still uh, 10 milliwatt per nine uh, minutes. Uh, they again con conflicting outcome compared to conventional protocol, and uh, CXL plus uh, is done to enhance and optimize CXL outcome. It basically improves functional vision. It can be done with conductive keratoplasty, PRK, and the corneal ring. And a very gentle reminder, you have 30 seconds to this uh, So this is, uh, CXL plus is mainly used in cases patients are unsatisfactory with visual function or they're intolerant to contact lens. And extra, I'm not going into this, but Dr. Sinema, next speaker is going to talk on extra. It can be combined with classic PRK and SMILE. And uh, usually the response to collagen cross-linking, corneal curvature improves, decreases, uncorrected distance visual acuity. The pachymetry decreases. However, after three months, it gets back to original. These are few of the RCT. There will be many studies. Uh, uh, literature. This is three-year result, which says there is a sustained improvement in uh, KMAX, UCBA, and BACBA. Another study which speaks about long-term result of collagen cross-linking, safe, and reduces the need of corneal transplantation, comparison between conventional and antiporosis, and this is worse but less than conventional protocol. 
indication are microbial keratitis, although it is used for microbial keratitis, but all sterile infiltrate and corneal edema, especially if the endothelial count is less or is not checked before we expose to UBA. We are already running late, ma'am. Yeah, so, you know. To conclude, it has been shown to effectively halt progression. It's easy to perform and good safety profile. There are various modifications to conventional protocol and combined with repetitive surgery. There is a reduced need of corneal uh, transplantation after plugin cross link. Thank you, Dr. Sajata. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a question. Is corn epithelium on a real no-no in your opinion? Yes. Correct. So let's be just because you have to mention your mention, but epi on is a definitely no-no. Am I right? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. I think there are other things we can do rather than epithelium on. All right, great. So message to everyone, just for record sake, she has mentioned, but then epithelium on is a definite no-no with most of the people in the panel here. Uh, we could go to the next speaker, Dr. Rajesh. Sure. Uh, the next speaker, Dr. Ritika, is unable to join, but she has nominated Dr. Raghav Malik from CFS, who will be uh, talking about the extra procedures along with cross-linking. Dr. Raghav is there? Hmm. Not yet. Then I'll have to request you. Okay. So he has just joined, sir. He's joined? Okay. Okay. Regarding the Repion, there is a group in the US that's showing successful results, but they are using a different formulation for the uh, Epion technique. The riboflavin is not the same as what we use, and they claim that their riboflavin has additional factors that allows better penetration, and their long-term results seem to be comparable. So we'll just have to wait and see. But with the regular riboflavin, you cannot do uh, cross-linking with Epion. Okay, uh, using distilled water instead of uh, dextran for swelling the cornea. Rajesh, would you have anything to say on that? Uh, we, we used to do that long back, but now after we have the uh, HPMC-based riboflavin, we achieve good swelling uh, with using that riboflavin itself of over more than 100 microns. Yeah, Dr. Raghav, welcome to the show. Man. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am Dr. Raghav Malik. I will be speaking about combining cross-linking and laser vision correction procedures. So, why do we need these uh, cross? Why do we need to combine these two procedures? What about the patients who have the borderline topographies, who have that bad D, who have that CBI that is a bit abnormal? Are those patients not allowed refractive surgery at all? We may just have a solution. So, we can combine LASIK, PRK. SMILE with cross-linking known as the extra procedures, while we can also do a PRK or PTK for keratoconus uh, procedures, but we are just talking about the LASIK PRK and SMILE in this session. So now uh, we know that uh, there is about 14 to 33% corneal weakening due to the flap creation. Once a flap is created, we know that the anterior, anterior stroma is cut along with the bowmans. So that does not contribute to the strength of the cornea. So hence we need to add something else in addition to make the cornea strengthen after the procedures. Now tissue subtraction along with uh, vertical cuts that we make in smile and delaminating cuts we made in smile can make the cornea weaker and this can lead to biomechanical instability and an ectasia can hence develop in future. So we need to keep an eye out for the preoperative high myopics or hyperopes, the thin corneas, the abnormal topographies that is the FFKC, a patient who is prone to excessive eye rubbing or allergies, a patient who is pregnant or breastfeeding in the first six months, hormonal imbalances and certain systemic and medicine that the patient is using. So now we know that a cornea which is cross-linked looked something like this, which is much differ than that which is not cross-linked. So the cross-linking restores strength to the cornea. It improves the flap bed adherence. That means that the flap does adhere much well to the stroma. There is a better tensile strength to the uh, cornea and the cross-linking reduces refractive regression and the risk of corneal ectasia. 
Apart from the biomechanical advantage, simultaneous cross-linking may also lead to less epithelial thickness increase, which is also implicated in uh, regression. That is an additional advantage. So the concerns with cross-linking uh, are that, what about the safety? Does it have an effect on the refractive effect? What about the haze and scatter caused by the haze post cross-linking? And what about the long-term outcomes? Is there a progressive flattening? Who is the right candidate for a, a combined extra procedure? It is the younger patients who are the 18s and the 19s. The high myopic patients, the minus nine, minus 10, wanting a refractive procedure. High hyperopic patients, patients with a borderline topography, like I mentioned previously, a bad D, the TBI, combining the uh, biomechanical index. A patient with a family of family family history of keratoconus, but himself or herself having the normal topography, and can we use this as a normogram for all patients? <clears throat> now, this is a lovely flowchart uh, given by uh, Dr. Uh, Shri and Dr. Brar. So, this is a, a patient coming to your OPD where we have to consider the following criteria: the age, the spherical equivalent if it is less than ten diopters. The thinnest pachymetry, the residual stromal bed thickness, the biomechanical indices, the CBI and the TBI, and the contributory family history like a keratoconus or allergic eye disease. If no such factor is present, we can safely proceed for a PRK, smile, or a LASIK. But if any of these are present, two or more, age less than 30, spherical equivalent more than six diopters, a suspicious topography, but no clinical uh, keratoconus, a thinnest pachymetry of less than 480 micron a bed thickness of between 250 and 280, a bad D of more than 1.65, CBI more than 0.5, TBI more than 0.29, and a positive contributory history. Are the people we may consider for a combined extra procedure? Now the riboflavin dye used is 0.25% concentration and HPMC is replaced uh, by dextran. And dextran is replaced by HBMC because dextran may predispose to DLK. Now this is how a LASIK extra procedure is it's done. We lift the flap immediately after the procedure. We put 0.25% riboflavin on the stromal bed, not on the flap. We let it soak for 60 seconds. And then we give uh, UV radiation through the flap after thoroughly washing the dye off. We use a total of 2.7 joule per centimeter square energy and 30 millivolt per centimeter square for a total of 90 seconds. This is for LASIK extra. We see this is the demarcation line that we, that we see in ASOCT. Again, why not through, through the flap? Because we avoid crossing the flap because it does not contribute to the biomechanical strength. Also, there could be flap shrinkage, which could lead to further issues like an epithelial growth. Now, these are many studies done that show that the higher refractive accuracy is found in patients with a refractive procedure combined with the cross-linking than with the cross-link than with the refractive procedure alone. And there is no progressive flattening seen. This has been proved in literature. We see that patient with a combined LASIK extra showed no significant changes in the spherical equivalent over time. And they are comparable to LASIK only. The finite element mod model calculates displacement in the residual bed when intraocular pressure is doubled. So if you see, when this is a patient where we combine cross-linking with LASIK, and we, if the pressure is doubled, the cornea is relatively flatter compared to a non-crosslink cornea. So it has less displacement when IOP is increased in a thinner cornea, which is less stiff. The number of studies done till now on LASIK extra in myopia as well as hyperopia. Uh, <clears throat> so we see that most of them all have very good post-operative uh, spherical equivalence and more than 80% have BCVA of 20 by 20, irrespective of the haze caused by the cross-linking, which, which goes over time. And also the energy we are using is half that of normal cross-linking. That is very important. And also we have similar high and good results in LASIK extra with hyperopic patients in, in LASIK. And LASIK extra is safe and effective. It has no effective surprises, no loss of contrast sensitivity, no light scatter, and no increase in patient discomfort. PRK extra is for the borderline topography and with low thickness for low powers and for retreatments. The pre procedure, we divide the epithelium we, after a PRK is done with MMC, now we add 0.25% riboflavin for 90 seconds, and then the riboflavin is rinsed off, and then UV radiation of 18 milliwatt per centimeter squared for a total of 2.5 minutes, with a total energy of 2.7 joule per centimeter square is given, and a BCL is applied. 
This is a patient who has an asymmetric bow tie appearance with a lower, with an inferior steepening, with the elevation maps quite normal and thickness 513. The BAD, we see the 2.57 BAD and the PTI is almost borderline. So such a patient would be an ideal patient for a PRK extra. Similarly, the left eye had a bad B of 3.4. So the patient did, underwent the PRK extra and was quite happy. <clears throat> now these are studies done on PRK extra. All patients had comparable refractive results post-op. Smile extra, similar protocol is followed. 0.25% ribofloven is injected in the cap, in, in the... Uh, in the pocket for 60 seconds and then rinsed off and UV radiation is given at 18 milliwatt per centimeter square for 90 se seconds, delivering a total energy of 2.7. This is a short video of how PR of LIS, of how Smile Extra is performed. Immediately after Smile is done, we inject dye inside the pocket. We leave it for about <clears throat> 60 seconds and then rinse it off and then Radiation is given for 90 seconds and total energy of 2.7 is given. These are the studies given for Smile Extra. Dr. Ganesh did a very good study on Smile Extra and he found that the Smile Extra was safe and feasible and no complications were observed. So this is a case of a 21-year-old female, the fraction of minus 5 with minus 0.5 cylinder and similarly minus 5.5 and minus 0.5 cylinder, vacuumetry of 536 and 537. Bad D in the right eye was 2.04, left eye 1.94. As you can see that the bad D is in the yellow zone and the CBI, that is the biomechan biomechanical strength was normal and the TBI was 0 0.12. Hence we performed, hence we proceeded with a smile extra and patient did very well. So to conclude, results of this review suggest that combined refractive study with a simultaneous CHL is generally safe and effective in stabilizing refractive and keratometric outcomes in patients. It can expand the scope of coronal refractive surgery, especially for patients who have a borderline and a weak pre-op topography, pachymetry and residual big th uh, bed thickness. Longer term studies are of course needed to see the safety. Refractive surgery with simultaneous softening is not recognized as a standard of care. It is therefore essential to weigh the benefits and the risk with the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raghav. You know, we lack of paucity of time, maybe we'll come back for questions later. But let's go on to the next speaker, Dr. Rajesh Fogla, to be talking to us on uh, Intax, you know, something very interesting. Are my slides visible? Yes, Rajesh, we can yeah. see your slides. So I'll be talking about another aspect uh, of treatment in the management of keratoconus. I have no financial interest to disclose. Now, we have heard about cross-linking, which arrests the progression in the refractive correction, besides using contact lenses and doing customized refractive surgery combined with cross-linking, intracorneal ring segments are a good option. These are basically devices made of PMMA of varying arc length and thickness. These have positioning holes. The newer ones come with asymmetric thickness, thinner on one side and thicker on the other side. And they are in different cross-sectional shape from hexagonal to oval to triangular. The common uh, products available with us are the Intax, the Intax SK, the Kera ring and the Ferrara ring. The Intax and Kera rings are FDA approved. It works once it is inserted in deep into the corneal stroma. It basically results in focal steepening at the site of implantation. The peripheral cornea is stretched, and this results in a central flattening. So if you look at this topography before and after intact implantation, a single segment was implanted. You can see the change in the corneal topography. And if you look at the pre and post topography, you can see the difference map, which shows you the significant amount of flattening. And notably, if you go in the pupillary area and look at the asymmetry between pre-op and post-op, you can see uh, why the patient's visual acuity improved after the implantation of the uh, intracorneal ring segments. How is it implanted? Commonly, we use the femtosecond laser, uh, although earlier we used to use the manual technique as well. The femtosecond laser is more versatile, easier to perform. It perform, creates channels which are uniform uh, depth all across and it is associated with lower uh, long-term risk of complication, especially extrusion of the uh, ring segment. This is how it looks post-operatively. You can see a single segment uh, in the lower 
uh, image and the double segment in the upper image. In patient selection, you do it. You can do it for mild to moderate keratoconus for post-classic ectasia. If you're using the intacts, uh, I usually like to do it for a maximum K of less than 50 adapters. Although the keratoring and ferroring, they uh, are implanted in a smaller uh, diameter area, so they can be used for steeper corneas. The minimum corneal thickness should be 400 microns at the site of implantation. There should not be any uh, corneal scarring because that can alter the outcome. And the patient should have realistic expectations from the surgery. This is a nice flow chart uh, described in the paper by Rohit Shetty from Narayan Netralia. So basically, how do you do your surgical planning? It depends on the location of the cone, whether it is central or it is displaced away from the center, the amount of superior inferior asymmetry, what is the mean spherical equivalent, and what is the mean characterometry. So let's look at some examples. So this is a patient uh, who has a moderate keratoconus and there is a decentered de cone and uh, the superior inferior asymmetry was not very high. So we went ahead with asymmetric rings. The superior ring was 250 microns in thickness. The inferior ring was 400 microns. And that's how it looked postoperatively. And you can see that there is significant uh, reduction in the keratometry and the astigmatism as well. So from preoperative about 624, the patient's unaided vision improved to 612 and best corrected improved to 66. This is another case with uh, asymmetric, uh, you know, the cone is displaced inferiorly and it's the, the, the steep K is not very high. It's about 50 diopters. We went ahead with a single segment implantation in this case to support the cone inferiorly and lift it up. And in here you can see from pre-op, 5 by 60 unaided, it improved to 618, and the best corrected visual acuity improved to 2020. So in this case, a single segment uh, helped improve the quality of vision. You can combine it with cross-linking to stabilize the keratoconus. You can further improve vision by giving a refractive correction using topography-guided PRK. You can even do a toric ICL implantation once the refraction is stable. And if there are any associated lens changes, you can think about doing a toric IOA implantation. This is a 30 year old male patient with uh, uncorrected visual acuity of 2200, best corrected of 2080. And he was not willing to wear uh, contact lenses and wanted some form of refractive correction. So we went ahead and this is his uh, higher order aberration. You can see the total aberration was 1.41. The coma was about 1.09. So the coma is the main reason why these people have deterioration in the quality of vision. So we went ahead, did a femtosecond laser assisted intact SK350 micron segment implanted at 400 micron depth. And post intact is visual acuity improved to 2030 best corrected. And you can see the change in the topography and it explains to you why there is improvement in the vision. And especially if you look at the higher order aberrations, you will find that his coma has reduced to 0.36 microns, which indicates why he was feeling better. Now we waited for three months and once his refraction was stable and the topography was stable, we went ahead and did a topography guided PRK with accelerated cross-linking. And the maximum ablation was in the center was only 31 microns. And this is how it looked post-operatively. His visual acuity best corrected improved to 2020 with just minus one with minus 0.75 cylinder. And if you look at the corneal topography, it looks almost normal. And if you look at the higher order aberration, his coma has further reduced to only 0.14 microns. And that explains why the vision uh, improved in this case. So this is the pre-op and this is the final post-op. Complications can happen with intacts. You can get channel deposits over a period of time. These are uh, whitish yellow deposits on the inner side of the ring. These are proteinaceous deposits along the channel. You see them more when you create the channels manually. And if you make the channel 360 degree, then you can have these channels, uh, the intact segments migrating towards each other. So you can have overriding of the implants. If you place your suture when you're doing two segments and you don't remove the suture, sometimes these loose sutures can lead to vascularization and then the blood vessels find it easy to grow into the tract and can result in lipid keratopathy. And sometimes if the overlying cornea is not sufficient uh, in thickness, the stromal uh, uh, tissue, then you, over a period of time, they can be progressive thinning, either due to disease progression or uh, thinning of the stroma and result in extrusion of the implants. So basically the tips for intacts would be select the right case and the implant type, uh, use femtosecond laser to perform the implantation, 
For additional procedures, I always prefer a sequential approach rather than doing everything simultaneously. If you want to perform cross-linking, you can do that either after a week or a month later. A stable refraction, usually I take it one to three months before I decide on what to do next. And the additional procedures like a topo-guided PRK or a fake will can be done once the refraction is stable. Thank you. Thank you for your patient here. Excellent, uh, Rajesh. Well, very much in time and always very particular, specific. Great insight into the whole substance. Uh, any of the ectesia cases that you've tried this? Any Anybody having ectesia and following that? that yes, you... for post LASIK ectasia, we have done single segment intacts and they do quite well. In fact, it is recommended for post LASIK ectasia if you see them. Even in the early stage, if you do a single segment, and one thing that I have always found is I don't do a cross-linking before and do the intacts later. I always recommend doing the intacts first and then followed by cross-linking at a later date. Because once you make that cross-linking and the collagen becomes stiff, and if you put in your intacts ring, you don't get the same kind of effect what you see when you do the intacts first. And I don't like to do it simultaneously because whatever said and done, you are placing an implant within the cornea. And sometimes you can have an infiltrate after you have put the if, intacts ring. So whether that's a sterile infiltrate from the cross-linking or whether that's an actual infective infiltrate, you won't be able to distinguish. So why mess it up? First do the intacts, let it settle down, and then come back and do a cross-linking later. So that kind of uh, seems logical and seems better. Is it six weeks? Let it settle down in six weeks according you, you to You can do it at... Uh, the, the keratocone is not going to progress uh, very rapidly, so you can do it even six weeks or eight weeks. It doesn't matter. In fact, uh, in certain of my patients where I've done intacts first, they have, some patients have not come back for their cross-linking and I've seen a patient 10 years after that, I've done the intacts and there has been no progression. So I don't know whether he was having progression before, but whether by placing an intact within the cornea, whether we are redistributing the forces, which, you know, lead to stabilization. I don't have an answer to that, but that would be something interesting to study and look at whether intacts alone can uh, slow down the progression of keratoconus. KP, do you have any questions? Sujata? No, no, sir. Like oh, Rajesh, uh, as usual, fantastic uh, stuff. If you, I just I was remembering uh, la, one and a half years before I went to Sri Lanka. So every most of the patients are those who underwent refractive procedure. Talking about Rajesh, even most of the doctors are very much uh, talking about Rajesh because that much of work even he has done even in Sri Lanka also. Really, we should appreciate him, sir. Dr. Ravindra, you have something? Yeah. Uh, uh, wonderful presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Thank uh, you. Sir. Have you done manual, uh, uh, you know, segments, uh, surgery? Yes. When, I, when I started off, uh, before we had the femtosecond laser, I was implanting my intacts using the manual. And it, what is the difference be, between it, them? The difference is that it used to be a little cumbersome because you had to do it under local anesthesia. Uh, uh, because of the amount of manipulations that you do. Once you give local anesthesia, then applying the suction ring, getting the centration is used to be an issue. And even if you make the, 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 the tracks, they used to be asymmetric at times. That means they are deeper at one end, shallower in the other end. And, you know, uh, compared to that, the femtosecond laser, the channels are tighter and you can really customize because once you apply the vacuum, you can move around the the, the fixation and you can definitely, you can customize it much more. Yeah. What is the tear film stability uh, of uh, these patients post uh, intacts? Are they better? Uh, they, are same better. Or what? they are better. They are better than what they used to have earlier. And somehow the, the, if you are putting the intact segment, the intact segment acts like the new limbal point. So sometimes you, the refraction, you have to be very careful because air will give you all kinds of readings, but that you can't use that reading for giving uh, glasses for these patients so they have to be refracted manually and you have to really but but patients do appreciate and they they have good improvement in vision but like i said it's not something you can use for each and every patient you have to uh, you know selectively if you do it you, you can get very good results is the progression of the uh, corneal uh, you know ectasia is any uh, indication or contraindication or a special indication for intacts you would cover that but can you be more specific Imagine, uh, you know, we have shifted a lot of our patients to contact lenses. They are so happy with modern right. contact lenses. The uh, surgical intervention has come down a lot. So what's sure. your comment on that contact? Absolutely. Lens so these, these are for the subset of patients who 
are not willing to wear a contact lens and are looking at something else. Otherwise, primarily, we try to fit every patient with a contact lens. Good. Thank you. We are not trigger happy gunmen. So we first try peaceful solutions, you know, contact lens to start with. So the quality of vision, what they can get with the contact lens, I don't think anything else can give them. So. Let's move to the next one. Vardhaman, are you there? Vardhaman had sent a message that uh, he has some other commitment. It got delayed, so he will not be able to join. So, so Dr. Reshma, I can see her here. I, I get. So, Dr. Reshma, are you oh, there? Yes. 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 Okay. And stress of losing a reference. Hello. Yes, Reshma. So, thank you for being there. Decentered ablation and small zone management. Another yes. one. Yes. Yes. I wanted to say something. Uh, yes, sir. Good uh, evening, uh, everyone. Uh, sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt. Actually, yes. I just sent a message. Uh, I'm moderating a session at LDP. I think mine is the last talk. So if you can just send me a message, I think mine is the last talk. So uh, I can come here to present my presentation. You could be next. Let's okay. do it. is not. Okay. So you'll be next after this. Okay. Then I can present and I'll go back. Then. Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Sir, KP, you wanted to say something, KP? Nothing, sir. You can, oh. Reshma can go ahead with the talk. Ah, oh, yes, sir. Dr. Reshma, we can see your screen. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Just letting you know your screen is already there. We can thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Reshma Ranade, Fellow in Cataract Refractive Optics and Clinical Research at Narayan Nitrale, and I'm here to talk on decentered ablation and small zone management. Uh, so without further ado, I take this humble opportunity to introduce to you all our DEAL nomogram, where D stands for decentration, uh, evaluation, and applying laser for correction. So let's go back to base basics and check what decentered ablation means. So this is optical axis, which is a line extending from the anterior to the posterior pole of the eye and taking into account the uh, centers of the crystalline lens in the cornea. Now, an ablation is said to be decentered when it, uh, when the center of the ablation does not correspond to the center of the optical axis. Now, having said that, if a patient comes to us with glare, halos, and difficulty in night vision with a history of refractive surgery, we at our center first uh, do a thorough workup, which is replete with the refraction, the dry eye evaluation, the non-strabismic binocular single vision evaluation with a binocular uh, assessment and orthoptics, the topography epithelial mapping, taking a look at the aberrations and the retinal examination. Now, what I need to highlight here is that not every patient who has symptoms or not every patient who has a decentered ablation needs to be lasered. So in case the patient does not have any symptoms, in that case, you can observe the patient and you need not go ahead with a laser regularization procedure. But on the other hand, if the patient does present to you with glare, halos, and difficulty in vision, and you have a topographic diagnosis of a decentered ablation, the first and the foremost thing to uh, which would uh, which would be would be to rule out a dry eye. So having said that, our dry eye assessment consists of assessment of the tear film, the epithelial mapping, the biography, the Schirmer's test, and the tear film breakup time. And if any of these are found to be abnormal and we make a diagnosis of dry eye, we need to treat it first. So uh, our treatment regimen consists of doxycycline, then low dose steroids and tapering doses, and a high viscosity agent like sodium hyaluronate and the topical immunomodulators like cyclosporin. Regardless to say the modern dry eye therapy devices like the vector pulsation therapy do play an important role. Now, once you have ruled out a dry eye and the patient has a decentered ablation, you can subject the patient to a contact lens trial because that is going to tell you whether he's going to improve with, uh, whether there's going to be an improvement in his symptoms or not. So if at all he improves with his symptoms, then you can go ahead and treat him with glasses or contact lenses. But in case your patient is unhappy or he's unwilling for glasses, in that case, you can probably offer him the option of a regularization procedure. But on the other hand, if there is no improvement in his symptoms, then you probably need to dig a little deeper and assess his lens status. Now, uh, what are the tools that we have to check the lens status? So we have the dysfunctional lens index, we have the pentacam nuclear staging, and we also take a look at the high, uh, internal aberrations in the nidic 3 
So if you have a poor DLI and a higher PNS and higher internal aberrations, you may probably have to go ahead with a lens-based approach. On the other hand, if you have a good DLI and uh, the PNS staging is normal with normal internal aberrations, uh, it would probably warrant uh, an orthoptic evaluation. So coming to the orthoptic evaluation, that is going to tell you whether uh, the patient has a virgin's disorder or it is an accommodative problem. So in that case, you need to treat him further first with office-based and home-based therapies. Now, this is a slide which explains uh, about the normal accommodation of the lens and the abnormal accommodation. Now, going ahead with the lens-based procedure, in case we have a poor DLI and a high PNS and higher internal aberrations, now, when will you plan a lens-based procedure? So, if at all the decentration is more than 0.5 millimeters, the higher order aberrations are more than one micron, the coma is more than 0.75 microns, and you see an irregular or a broad-based histogram on the EKR that suggests that you should probably regularize the cornea before you treat the cataract. Now, the question here is, would you want to treat the cornea first or would you want to go ahead with the cataract surgery first? So uh, we all know that uh, the dynamics of the eye would change once you do a laser ablative procedure. And so that change in the keratometry reading would be accounted for when you plan the intraocular lens power and you choose the power of the IOL that you need to implant in such a case. So it would definitely be uh, better that you do the corneal customization first before you go ahead with a cataract surgery. Now let's look at a few case examples. So we had a 32 year old lady who presented to us with a history of LASIK two years back complaining of star, uh, starburst and glare. On examination, she had a binoc uh, she had uh, a vision of six by six with the topography suggestive of a decentered ablation. So in this case, we found that while the quantity of her vision was restored, the quality was quite poor. Now we subjected her to a dry eye workup with which was replete with the Sherman's test, the mebography, the T-butt, and the corneal staining. And uh, the optical scattering index was on the higher side with 6.4 with a poor vision breakup time. We treated her with sodium hyaluronate uh, and cyclosporin for a period of four weeks and lipid flow. And we found a significant improvement with uh, an improvement in the OSI as well as an improved V-butt along with a happy patient. Let's look at another case. Now, this is a special case scenario wherein the decentered ablation was also with a cataract. So we had a 31-year-old gentleman with a history of LASIK done three years back with history of glare post-LASIK surgery. And the slit lamp evaluation uh, showed a nuclear sclerosis of grade two. Now we planned a PRK procedure for this patient on the Schwindemaris software. And since he was to undergo a cataract surgery later, we treated a zero refraction with the optical zone of 6.5. Now, the Schwind gave us an, a maximum ablation of 63 with a central ablation of 53. Now, we all know that the Schwind MRS software gives us an option of customizing the aberrations as well as minimizing the depth. So we went ahead and minimized the depth and treated the aberrations. And there was a significant decrease in the ablation uh, after depth minimization. So we went ahead, treated him, and this were, these were his comparative maps pre and post surgery. You can see that the EKR became better as compared to what it was before the custom ablation treatment. And after the stable topography was recorded, uh, at, which we define as uh, a change of less than 0.2 diopters in the mean K over three consecutive visits, we planned a cataract surgery for him and we implanted uh, a 24 diopters monofocal non-toric IOL using the ASCRS non post refractive surgery calculator. So to summarize here, I would say that uh, the symptoms are more important than the signs. The contact lens trial will definitely help you identify whether there is an improvement in the symptoms or no. Do not underestimate the role of uh, the uh, orthoptics evaluation and binocular single vision assessment then planning the lasers and cataract surgery after customized laser correction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reshma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reshma. That was wonderful. Great. Sujata, any questions? Good evening to you, Sujata. You are on mute. Sujata, you are on mute. 
excellent presentation, Reshma. It's a little bit over my head. I think I'll have to go through it again. <laughs> good, good one, good one. So, Reshma, you clean bowled everybody. So, I guess uh, you are too lucid and clear. Nobody has any questions. Dr. Ravindra, would you like to ask any questions? Yes, yeah, certainly. We uh, look at pupil, we look at uh, the lens, uh, we forget to look at the pupil. Uh, does pupil size has any significance? Like if the patient has a very small pupil, like a 2 mm pupil, which never dilates beyond 4 mm for some reason, uh, you know, would you still go ahead with the corneal surgery and then the lens, or would you prefer to? Have you done any study of uh, similar patients where they've undergone uh, your uh, corneal uh, fixing and then the lens surgery versus lens and reassessing them for their comfort levels or the results? So, sir, we have, uh, so I, as we all know that uh, the optical zone is calculated based on the mesopic pupil size. And uh, so paying attention to the mesopic pupil size is definitely uh, mandatory before we plan the procedure. So uh, we have studied a series of cases where we have done the ablation, uh, we have uh, treated the corneas first and then gone ahead with the cataract surgery. And we have definitely better results, sir. Just one question. You had a case which you had uh, treated for 53 years. Uh, is it that deep for uh, decentered ablation? The management of decentered ablation, one case which you showed, you had uh, taken away 53 microns of the cornea. Um, that is what you showed in your picture. If you can <coughs> a bit on the steeper side when you consider a patient who is having an epitasia or uh, uh, already a laser eye. We normally do go that deep. Normally, normally we do somewhere between 20 to 40, not uh, beyond that. Ma'am, ma could you please repeat the question? No, no, I'm no. sorry. One of your patients, which had showed the case presentation, yes, the depth of ablation was 53 microns. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering whether it would be a good thing to do for a patient who's already undergone laser, probably having probably a, a post classic ectasia. <clears throat> Is it a good thing to do to take away so much of tissue? Is that okay? Ma'am, we consider a cutoff of 400, ma'am. Okay. And we also use a mitomycin C in 0.02% concentration okay. after the procedure. Okay. okay. So great, Reshma. Thanks, thanks for sharing. We come to our because we are running short of time. We come to our next speaker, Anaga, who is, wants to leave for the next. Anaga is everywhere in all multiple sessions there. So Anaga is a prolific surgeon from Mumbai, and of course with the scientific committee ARC, and she is going to be speaking to us uh, on the algorithmic approach to manage post-refractive surgery dry eyes. Welcome, Anaga. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, very good evening to all the seniors here. Sorry for butting in like this. And uh, thank you for allowing me to speak out of my turn. Uh, I would be speaking on algorithmic approach to managing post-refractive surgery dry eyes. Yes, we all know that refractive surgery is one of the most commonly performed surgeries um, uh, for uh, reducing the uh, uh, glasses and dependence on glasses. But we also know that dry eye is one of the primary reasons of patient dissatisfaction, which can impact post-operative quality of vision and also quality of life. Now, if you see certain statistics, immediately after LASIK, almost as high as 95% of patients may report some dry eye symptoms and as high as 60% of patients may report it even one month post LASIK. Now, if you look at the pre-operative symptoms, there could be as high as a prevalence of 38 to 75%, which we need to pick up so as to avoid complications. Usually, it peaks in the first few months after surgery and settles down by 6 to 12 months. Now, if you look at the diagrammatic representation of a normal corneal nerve anatomy of the um, eye, you can see that this is the subepithelial plexus, the subbasal plexus ending in the sensory nerve terminals in the epithelium. And this is the difference between LASIK and SMILE, which I would be now el elaborating in the next few slides. Now, if you look at PRK, for example, we know that there's no flap creation and hence there's lesser damage to the subbasal plexus and lesser to the deeper stromal nerve. So probably it would be better than LASIK. Now, if when you look at LASIK, basically what happens is the disruption of both the dense subbasal nerve plexus as well as the stromal nerves in the creation of the flap, which causes denervation of the cornea leading to decreased corneal sensitivity and hence reflex tear secretion is reduced. Now, if you compare a vertical hinge versus the horizontal hinge, 
probably a horizontal hinge would be better because it would only affect one side of the uh, nerves, whereas in vertical, both the sides would be cut. But studies have shown at the end of six months, probably it may not be statistically significant. There are also some people have uh, proposed surgical techniques like smaller flaps with larger hinges, which may reduce risk of post-operative dry eye or thin planar flaps, which may have lesser dry eye. Now, there are certain studies which have compared SMILE with femtosecond LASIK. And in this case, we have seen that here it says that SMILE may create fewer dry eye symptoms and that corneal sensitivity was greater after SMILE versus femtosecond LASIK. So we all know that because in SMILE there is a lesser, um, there is no flap, there is just a small cap cut. Definitely that is the reason why there is less cutting of nerves and hence less disruption of the normal uh, corneal nerve anatomy. However, there are studies which also show that there is no significant difference in the corneal re and sensitivity between both of them at six months post-operatively. Like in this study, they have shown that SMILE does not show obvious superiority and SMILE patients may just have milder subjective symptoms. And this study shows that SMILE shows superiority over femtosecond LASIK. So basically, it is all the SMILE surgeons would have faced patients both ways. Now, this graph shows that the mean corneal sensation uh, after SMILE came back much earlier, but at the end of six months, the statistics was the same. So if you look at the probable pathophysiology of post-refractive surgery dry eye, one reason could be damage to the subbasal nerves, decreased corneal sensitivity, decreased tear secretion, and ocular surface inflammation causing dry eye. Another pathophysiological mechanism could be just a decreased blink rate because of decreased corneal sensitivity, causing decreased meibomian gland secretion, unstable tear film, decreased T-butt. There could also be damage to goblet cells due to suction, leading to altered expression of mucin, leading to instability in the tear film, or just the alteration in the corneal curvature can cause an alteration in the expression of mucin. We all know that dry eye has a very significant proportion of inflammation. It's basically an inflammatory disease. So it could be because of pressure or direct action on the nerve. This could exacerbate a pre-existing dry eye and basically there are release of inflammatory cytokines in the tear film and the conjunctival epithelium. Now, confocal microscopy has shown, like in this slide here, tortuosity neuroma. So basically, a post-refractive Dry eye could also be maybe because of pain without stain, which could be triggered by the refractive surgery. So a patient could have disproportionately increased symptoms compared to just signs. Or it could be just that preoperatively a patient had aqueous deficiency or evaporative dry eye, which was missed and that has significantly worsened. So what we as refractive surgeons need to do is a thorough preoperative evaluation right from history, ask for contact lens intolerance, which is a very great indicator that the patient may have dry eye, allergies, medication use, especially anti-glaucoma medications, associated systemic diseases, in the presence of which you would immediately refer it to an immunologist or a rheumatologist. Use patient questionnaires so as to make your job easier, maybe OSDI or DUQ5. Examine the patient like you would do for a proper dry eye patient mm -hmm. with all the tests that would do that you would do for a routine dry eye patient, including uh, the T-BAT and the inflammatory biomarkers. We have a lot of gadgets also we can use for non-invasive tests. This is a clinical photograph of a typical line that's a LASIK-induced neurotrophic epitheliopathy staining. These are the confocal microscopy images showing increased bending of nerves, tortuosity, and then the early nerve regeneration post-LASIK. So how is the management different compared to a, refract, a routine dry eye? So basically, we follow the TFS uh, uh, DUES2 guidelines, educate the patient regarding environmental modifications, use tear substitutes, preservative-free would be preferred, you can also use the newer thermal-based uh, therapies like the IPL or the Lipiflow. Definitely, Lipiflow cannot be used in the immediate post-operative period. Role of anti-inflammatory agents like cyclosporin, for example, may need to be continued for longer duration, even up to, uh, up to four months. This basically helps to prevent activation of T-cells and inflammatory cytokines. Topical steroids will act as an anti-inflammatory uh, mode of treatment. It reduces and breaks the inflammatory cascade and host of me me mechanisms which will help to reduce the ocular irritation and reduce the amount of dry eye. Definitely the strength and the duration of steroid would depend on the severity of the problem. Basically, if you have diagnosed a meibomian gland dysfunction in the preoperative period, you need to pre-treat it, improve the MGD by all the procedures like the lid hygiene, warm compresses or IPL therapy so as to avoid complications in the post-operative period. 
you could also use supplementary therapies like omega-3 fatty acids and as well as the role of vitamin D as an adjuvant therapy. So to conclude friends, pre-operative dry evaluation needs to be done in these patients before you take them up for a refractive surgery. See whether they are an aqueous deficiency, evaporative dry eye, mixed or a neuropathic dry eye. If it is a severe dry eye or avoid a refractive surgery totally, if it's just mild or moderate, you would treat them pre-operatively and also post-operatively evaluate them. And depending on the severity and the grade of the type of dry eye, you would treat them whether it's aqueous deficiency, evaporative dry eye, neuropathic pain, and also keep a lookout for toxic dry eye disease. So this was basically the algorithmic approach to evaluation and management of dry eye disease. So basically a comprehensive understanding of the possible... I'm factors. just a reminder, you have 30 more seconds to go. Yes, if so we also need to take a detailed history, a customized algorithm like I just described, a systematic approach, timely tests and diagnosis, and appropriate medications and treatment for an adequate duration will ensure good outcomes. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank and you. thank you so much for accommodating me. Thank you, Anaga. It was a nice talk. Just I wanted to ask you one question that, uh, see, the different modalities of treatment uh, you already explained. In the severe cases with MGD dysfunction, do you do post-classic highlight treatment to the patient also? Yes, sir, we do. We do. In fact, we do a dry eye workup for all our refractive patients. And if we find that they have MGD, we usually all pre-treat the patient with not only the conventional method, but also with IPL and then continue the IPL post-op. But because it is non-invasive, unlike Philippi flow, we can immediately do it within a week's time also. You are post-refractive surgery? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. I think you are still with the LDP program. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, logging in. I think uh, yeah. now we'll go to... Uh, I'm sorry, I would love to leave, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, now I invite Dr. Sujata Mohan. Sujata Mohan is a prolific uh, uh, FACO refractive from Chennai. Uh, I think uh, Madam has been doing LASIK treatment since quite uh, ages of years. We need to hear from her. Uh, what about how she'll manage post-LASIK ectasia? Over to Madam. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kudlu. I think probably only both of us are here now. <laughs> I'll give the last talk of the day. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the scientific committee for giving me this uh, opportunity. So a definition of post elastic ectasia is a, it's a rare and serious complication after refractive surgery. There is a progressive steepening and thinning of the, uh, uh, of the cornea. The incidence is about one in 2000, and the incidence among surgeons have been reported as has high as 52%. It's a progressive condition and can present any time between six to 24 months with an average of 13 months after LASIK. And it's usually characterized by visual disturbance like glare and halos. So diagnostic clues are increasing myopia, increasing cylinder, change in characterometry and topography, inferior corneal steepening, change in wavefront analysis, increase in higher order abrasions, decreased pachymetry and loss of un uncorrected visual activity. So this is a characteristic case, a case of post-lasic ectasia. You can see the eccentric inferior and paracentral uh, steepening with almost all the parameters being uh, uh, affected. So what are the risk factors? A suspicious topography is probably something which you have to look into. An asymmetric bow tie is probably one of the characteristic hallmarks of an early keratoconus. Skewing of the radial axis with the IS ratio of greater than 1.4 is another uh, important parameter that you have to look for, you know, screening a patient for uh, elastic surgery. And posterior elevation, uh, when you look at this map, there's hardly anything wrong with this map, uh, map except for an IHT, which is red. But when you look at the posterior Bellin amplosu, you can see the uh, advanced state of the keratoconus in showing a high, high posterior elevation. Uh, which shows that the keratoconus can most often start at the posterior aspect of the cornea and only screening the uh, anterior portion, the sagittal maps alone are not enough. Another important parameter that we have to look into is the residual stromal bed thickness and several biomechanical studies have reinforced the importance of this. The stress strain analysis and cohesive tensile strength analysis have indicated that the corneal strength is significantly greater in the anterior 40% of the cornea than in the posterior 60%. Santiago et al. found that the percentage of tissue altered after LASIK should not exceed 40%, where the, it's calculated the risk of uh, ectasia increases. So the PTA has calculated that uh, with the flat thickness, with the ablation depth divided by the central corneal thickness. 
The PTA greater than 40% is strongly associated with the development of ecclesia in otherwise normal topography. The other important factor is that thalassic flap does not contribute to the tensile strength of the cornea. There is a loss of structural integrity and biomechanical strength in the cornea of thalassic. It reduces the overall load bearing tissue, shifts the load bearing structurally to the weaker posterior stroma. However, the RSB of 250 microns as a cutoff does not absolutely discriminate between eyes that will develop ectasia and those will not. RSB seems to work continuous variable with the risk of ectasia increasing with decreasing RSB. Age is again a very important factor. The younger the age, the more significant is the chance of patient developing ectasia. This may be partially explained by the fact that the corneal tensile strength increases with age. The other important parameters which are interrelated are the pachymetry of the cornea, the degree of myopia, and the decimal, uh, stromal bed. Low CT has been found to be a risk factor in all the published studies. Thinner corneas may be an early indicator of KK, and the thinner corneas are at higher risk than lower RSV. So looking at the ectasia scoring system, it takes into consideration the residual stromal bed, the age, central corneal thickness, mean spherical equivalent, and abnormal topography. And a high myopia, which is greater than 88 diopters, has a higher risk due to the lower RSP and a deeper ablation depth. Other risk factors are eye rubbing, family history of keratoconus, refractive instability, best corrected visual activity of less than 20 20 pre op, and a male gender. One significant criticism of the risk score system is that any individual less than 22 years is automatically classified as a moderate risk despite the low incidence of ectasia in this age group. Other risk factors are Down syndrome, family history of connective tissue disorders, ocular allergy, HOP, and mechanical factors such as eye rubbing and floppy eyelid syndrome. Pregnancy and hormonal changes in PCOS seem to affect the corneal biomechanics and may be an independent risk factor. So the management would consist of reassuring the patient, restoring the vision, and preventing progression. And a consensus of opinion is the occurrence of ectasia per se is not a deviation from the standard of care and does not mean that the patient was a poor candidate for refractive surgery. So collagen cross-linking, I think I will not touch upon this because enough has been said by Dr. Sujata Das. And this is one of the, uh, probably post-lasic India's uh, ectasia is one of the indications for early cross-linking in these patients. It can be combined with topochidal laser, it can be combined with intax, and also with uh, an accelerated cross-linking. Accelerated cross-linking has been uh, explained again by Dr. Sujata Das. But just to give an overview, the basic idea here is to get a 5.4 joules per centimeter squared and can be, uh, by, it can be done by reducing the, increasing the power and reducing the time. And the normal uh, accelerated cross-linking that we all prefer is uh, 10 milliwatts for, uh, sorry, nine milliwatts for 10 minutes. That's a, a thing and it's shown to be equivalent to the resident protocol. So topography and ablation profile to create the asymmetry of the cornea. Here you can see this is a very typical keratoconus post lasic ectasia. And you can see here the ablation is done uh, uh, not only in, over the cone, but also creates a hypropic ablation to make the cornea more symmetric. So these are some of my cases which have uh, post and pre and post topoguided PRK with cross-linking. You can see the drop in the cylinder from 5.5 to 1.25 and significant drop is uh, noted. Intacts are uh, corneal inserts which can normalize corneal topography, causes central corneal flattening. The angle of insertion can be varied depending upon the irregular astigmatism. And like Dr. Rajesh emphasized, even single segment might be enough in these cases. And they have excellent refractive effect. These are some of the patients who have, this is one of my patients, you can see a minus six, minus six, uh, show, uh, dropping to plus 2.5 post uh, intacts. And you can see the comparison map showing an excellent uh, response after intacts. Other treatment options are contact lenses, the uh, Roske hybrid lenses, and most importantly, the Boston lenses, which are uh, very, very useful, particularly the mean, many sliver lenses, which have come to the market in about three, four years. And this has reduced the incidence of, um, uh, incidence of keratoplasty after uh, post lasic ectasia. So last but not the least, in patients who have not responded to any of these treatment and what better uh, results than probably uh, what they are getting, Probably the only uh, thing you have to go in for is uh, keratoplasty. And today, the standard of care is uh, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty for the post lasic ectasia. So, preventive procedure, uh, I think one of the previous people spoke about lasic extra, and um, where uh, already I think she went through the entire procedure. This can be done um, post lasic uh, to prevent uh, uh, post lasic ectasia. The clinical pearls here are to monitor serial refraction, look for change in the keratoscopic myers, 
look for early clues like ghosting and glare, monitor IOP, have a full armamentarium of treatment available, and most importantly, reassure the patient. Early diagnosis and appropriate management gives best results. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, MS Ravindra sir is here. Any inputs from your side, sir? No, it's a, a, a fantastic coverage of the entire refractive surgery. There's nothing much we can add to what Dr. Sujata has already covered. And uh, uh, I mean, that's it. Uh, no, I have no, no additional comments on this. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you for, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, Dr. Ravinder Sir, Dr. Fogla, and Dr. Himam Shumata. Thank you, all the speakers. Sujata, madam, is also here for this uh, wonderful session. This is the, probably the first time in AOS we started this subspeciality day. The exclusive refractive, uh, uh, refractive treatment uh, subspeciality where someone wants to start the refractive surgery also. If they would have logged in at 12 o'clock and end by this time, I think definitely they'll go ahead with buying a refractive. Krishna Prasad, your, your experiences, you should comment because you've been doing a refractive surgery a lot. Can you comment on, uh, you know, summarize on all the uh, lectures that were held today? Yes. Sir, like uh, the, uh, the, of course, uh, basic first, we started with the what and all the equipment really, the uh, investigation in equipment required and everybody is telling, I think if you have got Pentacam, that does most of the job. Then a lot of, even people spoke about Galilee, Sirius and all. This is all additional future. But once you, when you're starting, if you have Pentacam, it does most of the job. Then once if you are like picking up your practice, if you want to upgrade your practice into a presbyopic, uh, uh, presbyopic treatment, then you need to have a abrometer. Like preferably eye trace, that is what the everybody is telling, which can even pick up a lot of abrasions out of the eye. Most probably even dysfunctional lens index also it can pick up. Then about the treatment, I think uh, after the call, depending upon the power of course, PRK is the gold standard. You've been talking about PRK since a quite long period. You have done a wonderful job as far as PRK is concerned. What what percentage of your practice is PRK versus uh, uh, femto smile. versus... Uh, yeah. My yeah. actually 60 to 70 percent is smile and remaining 40 percent is PRK. What about and, Sujata? The 10 percent, uh, 10 to 15 percent PRK, sir. The rest is uh, femto. More, I, I hardly do standard nowadays. Okay. What about smile? You switched out to smile? No, sir. They are not at God. Fine. So, then there are like a discussion about how smile is better than femtolasic. There are a lot of studies being showed in today's talk by different speaker. Probably because of, I think, so many factors, I think smile have a definite edge over femtolasic. But smile doesn't have a edge over PRK because still PRK people consider it to be a gold standard uh, treatment. In then, our uh, practice, we we almost for the last uh, seven, eight years, we have switched over. Majority are uh, surface. surface. Yeah, the, uh, we call it as smile? ASA. Uh, what about your incidence of smile? How many patients? Do you Smi have? Smile, we, we uh, hesitated to buy the machine yet. Uh, okay. We would like to. We, we, uh, we, uh, switch over between the smile versus femto versus uh, flap we still do the flap yeah. uh, but but smile is uh, you know considered as i mean i'm glad that increasingly as dr krishna prasad also has mentioned it increasingly it's becoming more and more and it's possible with titration with the explanation to the patients first first two days is what patient has to uh, you know get used to you know mentally be prepared for that but then the results with uh, our, uh, you know, we have done a lot of experiments, a lot of innovations in surface ablations, and uh, that's my first priority. My uh, one thing about uh, surface ablation, I would not uh, ablate beyond 10 diopters, sir. I would rather switch for a fake eye veil or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's accepted. Most of the, see, more, if you look at the, everybody, everybody. Look at the spectrum, most of the time we are operating between three to six. Yes. I mean, up to six, seven, it's, it's very comfortable. Yeah, even Dr. Today, Praveen Krishna also had a full uh, experience about his PRK patients also. He explained very well. Then later on, I think uh, we had a discussion about the fakey cleanses, uh, about all different variety. Then later on, I think you are also there, part of the, this. Program. One question I had was, if time time is there, I do not know, which is the best viscoelastic for fakey eye oil? You know, you must be doing a lot of eye oil and IPCLs. Uh, you know, you would have 
tested you know by you can you can go and commit on which which is the best i still put a dispersive sketch one dispersive scale uh, dispersive okay dispersive i also put dispersive sir okay i also put, although there some of them i know i think sri ganesh is using for his self i somehow I, i used it in a couple of cases and i felt that uh, the pressure was high but that is with disposal i have not had any problems okay. do, you, do you do you use any anti glaucoma drops see no, somebody no. nicely said don't use pilocarpin i never use pilocarpin for these patients i even never use pilocarpin because of uh, uh, post op uh, lot of reaction will be there with the pilocarpin you know, but they so, um, cornea is clear uh, yes. iot is fine I mean, it's i'm very very happy with dispersive uh, viscoelastic no i use dispersive but then uh, talking to people i was looking at should i change over to cohesive uh-huh. but then i was hearing sri ganesh i did for two cases not very happy i okay. good 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 that i uh, raised this question yeah thank you sir thank you, thank you. very much for your kind inputs thank you madam thank you ananda thank you bye bye bye